You know, I noticed that some of you are not quite sure when to clap or if you should clap. Is this okay? Let me just explain because I think it's a little bit of a weird thing sometimes. Uh, unlike a concert where you clap for the performance, we as worshipers clap because our hearts agree with what we're singing. So if that's true, if you, if you believe I'm alive in him, it's okay to clap. It's great. The psalmist says clap your hands, make a joyful noise, not because we think they're awesome, although they are, but because God is awesome, and we agree with that. So I think that's wonderful when you're, when you're moved to do that. But I know what happens. Some of you go, hey, oh, we're not doing this now, right? <laughs> it's all right. So join in, and we'll praise him together. As you saw a moment ago, we're joining, we're beginning a brand new series on the book of James. I always get excited when we get a brand new series. I get excited when we're in the middle of a series and at the end of a series too. But um, this, this is a summer series, and summer is a time when people come and go. I know I won't see some of you for a few weeks. You've got things to do, and we'll be in and out. Uh, and James is a great study because while it's one letter— one book of the New Testament, each uh, portion of it sort of stands alone. Uh, but additionally, we want you to be able to track along with us. Uh, most of you know that on our church app, you can download any of the sermons from any of the campuses that are available on Monday after we preach them, and you can share them easily with friends. But in addition, throughout the summer, we're providing you with study notes, resources to go along with the, the sermons, to read along with and study along with the book of James, and a place for you that are digitally minded, want to take your notes not with pen and paper, but on the app itself is a place for you to take notes on there. So you can get study notes, get the sermon, and keep your own notes right there on the app throughout the summer. We hope you'll take advantage of that and grow as we study God's Word together. Let's bow in prayer and ask God to speak to us. Father, we've been hearing and singing about the truth of who you are, that we're alive in you, and that it's because of you we're here to worship. And now we come to your Word, and we know because you've told us that it's living and active. So we ask you, Jesus, who are the living Word, to speak to us through your written Word. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, let's talk about James a little bit, give you a little background into this book, which is uh, really interesting. It's one of the shorter books in the New Testament, like many of the New Testament books. If you're, not, if you're, if you're kind of new to Bible study, it's a letter. Most of the New Testament were, are letters. James wrote the letter. Most of the letters are named by the author who wrote them, although not all of them, so don't be confused by that. For example, Timothy is written by Paul to Timothy, but James is written by James. We'll get to who it's to in a minute. It was one of the earliest books of the New Testament ever written written somewhere between 45 and 50 A.D., so really early uh, letter written by James. James, there's a number of people in the New Testament referred to as James. The one you're probably thinking of is James, the, son, the brother of John, who is the sons of Zebedee. Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder. That's a pretty cool nickname, right? Uh, to, if you're going to have a nickname, you could do worse than that, son of thunder. But this is not that James. This is James the apostle, James the disciple. This is a different James. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Think about that. He's the half-brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. That must have been weird, to have the Son of God as your sibling. Like when, when Mary and Joseph lose Jesus in the temple and they have to go back three days and find him, he doesn't even get in trouble. I bet James is going, that wouldn't happen if it was me. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is the half-brother of Jesus, and it appears that James was not a follower of Jesus during Jesus' public ministry on earth. He was not a believer or a follower of him until after the resurrection, when Jesus appears to him specifically. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians. But in John chapter 7, we read this, that, that even Jesus' own brothers did not believe in him. In fact, Jesus is in a synagogue in Galilee, and his brothers show up and say, hey, stop saying this crazy stuff about being the Son of God. They try to make him stop. They try to remove him. And it says that they don't even believe in him, at least not the way that Jesus was calling them to, until after the resurrection. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have a sibling, a brother or sister? What would it take for you to come to believe that your brother or your sister is God of the universe, Lord of heaven and earth, and that you must bow and worship them? I have two sisters. One of them attends church here. I think that would be impossible for her. She'd probably tell you he thinks he's Lord of the universe, right? right? When I was growing up. Well, think about that for a minute. What would it take for you to come to, re to come to believe that your sibling is Lord of heaven and earth, God in the flesh? It's not all that surprising that James doesn't believe at first. But then he does. The skeptic turned true believer and leader because of an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. In ways, like all of us. James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. 
Peter is the first leader of the church in Jerusalem. When in Acts chapter 2, Peter gives the great speech at Pentecost. 3,000 people are converted and the church begins. Peter is the first primary leader, but he goes to Rome later in the story and becomes the pillar of the church in Rome. And James stays and becomes the leader, sort of the primary shepherd leader of the church in Jerusalem. Let's, let's read James 1, verses 1 through 18. You can follow along in your own Bible or on the screen. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and let the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the, or of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers with the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, give birth to, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We'll stop there because that's probably more than we could even cover this morning. James is, refers to himself in his greeting as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word for servant is the Greek word doulos. It doesn't mean, uh, it actually means slave, but not like chattel slavery in, you think of in, in America, uh, pre-Civil War South. It refers to a uh, bond servant one who willingly surrenders to another's will, sometimes to work off a debt, sometimes because it's a better financial situation for your family. If you're uh, below weight, if you're being oppressed and if you have no income, you make yourself a servant or a slave to someone else. So James is saying, I willingly call myself a slave of Jesus. Think about that. What would it take for you, brothers and sisters, to call yourself a worshiper and a slave to your sibling? He doesn't say, I'm, I'm Jesus' brother. He says, I'm his servant which is fascinating to me. And unlike Paul, when you read a lot of, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, unlike Paul, who's flowery in his greetings, grace and peace to you, he says, James just says, James, the slave of Jesus, greetings, right? He's just very direct, very matter of fact in his book and very practical. That's why we're calling this series Street Level Faith because James, unlike lots of writers in the New Testament, particularly Paul, he spends almost no time talking about doctrine or theology or understanding the gospel or the cross. He sort of assumes you know that. He cares primarily about what does your faith look like in your life? In your home, on your street, in other words. Lived out in your life. That's his primary concern throughout. And in this first section, he's talking about what does your faith look like when you face trials, when you face difficulties. Now, he says to the 12 tribes in dispersion. Now, what does that mean? That's a Jewish way of referring to the nation of Israel. To those Christians who grew up Jewish, Israelites, members of the 12 tribes, it's a metaphoric reference to Jews, who are in dispersion, meaning they're no longer in Israel or Jerusalem. They've been scattered or dispersed. We'll talk about why that is. In Acts chapter 7, there's a story of the stoning of a man named Stephen. Stephen was one of the early leaders of the church. He gives this great speech to the Jewish Sanhedrin, to the high council. And in the speech, he basically says, you people are stiff-necked and stubborn and evil, and you put Jesus to death. And they don't like that very much, which is not surprising. And they stone Stephen and kill him the first martyr of the church. And that sparks this persecution where Christians in Jerusalem are fearing for their lives. They end up having to flee. Acts chapter 8, verse 1 says it this way. It says, and this is the, the reference, Acts 8, verse 1. Oh, do you have that right? There we go. And Saul approved of his execution. That's Saul who becomes the apostle Paul, by the way. 
who wrote most of the New Testament. But at this point, he hates the church and is out to destroy it. And there arose in that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So James, while most of these Christians who are, grew up Jewish, believe in Jesus, now have to flee for their lives all around Judea, Samaria, and Asia Minor, he stays. I should tell you something about his character. He stays in Jerusalem. He doesn't run. And he writes this letter to Christians who are living in fear, running for their lives, quite literally, having to leave businesses and families, experiencing poverty because they leave it all behind. That's who he's writing to. Now, what we all face, what we all face, he, he calls them trials of various kinds. He doesn't explain what the trials are or where they come from. He just says, when you face difficulty, trials, hardship, pain, loss, disappointment, from beginning to end, the Bible is clear that those who trust in God don't get a pass on this. We're not immune to hardship. Because you're a very religious person, the Bible does not say, therefore, you got this spiritual force field around you and you won't have a hard life. Quite the opposite. We're not immune from trials or difficulty or pain. And I know many of you know that firsthand. Looking out and seeing some of you who I know and love, I know we've, you've experienced those trials and those pains and those hardships. Job chapter 5, verse 7, Job says, Man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. It's just part of being a human being. We know this. And if you don't know this, just give it time. Life is full of difficulty and, and pain, loss. It's part of human experience. Let me read verses 1 and 2 again of James. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. That is a shocking statement, isn't it? Count it joy? Like, I could understand if it says, get through it, hang on, grit your teeth, but count it joy? We'll come back to what he means by that. This is actually not that shocking a thing in the ancient world. To say life is hard and full of pain would not be surprising to someone living in the And in many parts of the world today, if you travel outside the developing world, you know that there are many people today in all kinds of parts of the world for whom... Saying life is hard is like, yeah, duh. They experience hardships that if, if they came to us in our culture would undo most of us. And they experience them as just part of life. So writing to first century Christians living in the Roman Empire, in, in Palestine and in the Roman Empire, this is not new news that life is hard. But we're living in perhaps the worst country or society in human history for helping prepare people to deal with suffering. I think that's true. I'll say that again. I, I think that we are living in perhaps the worst culture or society in human history in terms of helping its citizens deal with suffering. Because in our culture, suffering is bad. If life is hard, it's someone else's fault. And the whole point is to avoid that pain, anesthetize that pain, find a way out of that pain, and find who's to blame for it. A good friend of mine calls it a crybaby culture. I didn't say that. He said it, right? I'm saying it now, but I'm recording him, right? We live in a culture where it's someone else's fault. My hardship, my pain. Some people can be sued for that or blamed for it or at least attacked on social media. Find, find out who is the cause of your hardship. But by all means, get out from under it because we think suffering is not supposed to be. We have whole industries set up to alleviate pain. Medically speaking, cosmetically speaking, emotionally, relationally, we just don't deal with it well. That's not been true of much of the world. And here's part of the reason why. The primary worldview in our culture is what I would call a secular materialist worldview. Meaning this, a materialist worldview is that this life is all there is. Or maybe there's something beyond this life, but we don't really know. If this life is all there is, then the joy and the hope and the peace and the prosperity that you experience in this life are ultimate, aren't they? Because there's nothing beyond. And if you lose the joy, the peace, the prosperity in any measure in this life, you lose it ultimately. But for most of human history, Christian or not, human beings have understood that this life is not all there is. And therefore, I can lose a bit of joy and peace and prosperity in this life. And it still is painful, but it's not ultimate. You see the difference? We're living in a culture where it's like you go around once. This life is it. What I have here is what I have eternally or at all. 
All our eggs are in this basket, in other words. We're not supposed to suffer. Let's talk about how we face it then. What we face, we all face pain and trials of various kinds. How we face it. What's unique about James' message is not that we suffer, it's, it's how we should face them. Let me read verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, that phrase perfect, we hear perfect and we think without fault. That's not what the biblical authors mean most of the time, unless they're referring to God's character by the word perfect. They're talking about whole, a whole life, a life of integrity. Like uh, 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 integers versus fractions. I integrity comes from the, word, from the root word integer, which means whole number versus a fraction. Most of us live fractured lives, meaning we, we aren't consistent with, in our life, on our, in our home, on our street, with what we say we believe. There are inconsistencies, hypocrisies, or at least gaps. Would you agree? We live beneath the level of our stated convictions. And that's especially true when trials come. Puts a microscope a magnifying glass on what we say we believe and how it bears itself out in our lives. So he says you may be whole, a whole person, a person of integrity whose life matches up to your faith, in other words. Now, let me walk you through three Greek words. I know this is kind of fun for me. hope it is for you. Um, in, in verses 2 through 4 that are really important to understand what James is saying. When he says count it all joy, that word count, or your Bible might say consider, is a Greek word hegeomai. It's a compound word that means to place in the proper uh, account. It's a word from accounting, actually. Like when you put an expense or, or, or an income on the right side of the ledger, you have to account for it in the proper place. That's the idea behind this word. James is saying, stop, think, account for your trial and put it in its proper place. Make the conscious decision to think deeply and account for what's happening to you rightly. That's really important to understand what he's saying there. He's not saying everything bad that happens you should be happy about. That's what it sounds like, right? It's not what he's saying. He's saying when trials and difficulties come to you, they're hard. Yes, they're hard. We grieve. We suffer. It's painful. But you need to think about what's happening and put it in its proper place, proper perspective. It sounds like he's advocating a kind of masochism here, but it's not so. To make the deliberate choice to account for my current trial, my current pain, in the right place. The second word is from the word know. In verse 3, he says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance or endurance or steadfastness. The word know is the word gnosko. It means knowledge that comes from experience. You've lived it. You've experienced it. You know this by experience. So James is saying, when you face trial and pain, stop, think, Account for that in the right place because you know by experience what God can do, what God will do. And the third word is the, from the word testing. It says the testing of your faith. It's the Greek word doikimion. It's the word or root word used when they talk about refining silver or gold by fire. It means to burn off the dross or the slag from silver or gold so that you have a pure metal. So James is saying when you face trials, stop, think. Remember your own experience. God is doing something, refining you through this pain. That though it hurts for a time, it's going to produce something in you. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. These trials have come, so the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes through fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You see what he's saying now? Not, you should just be happy, put on a smile, because life is hard. He's saying, think about what God is doing in the midst of this, or what he could do in the midst of it. Place that trial in its proper account. Now, if you have a materialist worldview, this life is all there is, where do you put that pain? What other side of the ledger is there? There's only this life. There's no eternity. There's no ultimate meaning. So you just try to escape it. James is saying, learn to put suffering in its proper place. And I, I, I think you've probably seen this too. We've all seen how this plays itself out in people's lives. As a pastor, I've been with people, I know people who no longer come here or don't go to any church because they faced horrible pain and trial, suffering. And I've talked to them. They're basically like, I, I used to believe, but I just can't reconcile this, what I've been through with God. And so I walked. I just walked. Maybe you know people like that. I also know people 
who have faced equally horrific trials, and they have a depth of soul to them that you can just feel when you're around them. When you're around somebody who has a deep faith, can you just tell by the kind of things that they say, the way they talk about God, the way they listen? You can just feel it from them, can't you? And when you're around somebody of deep faith, it's because they've been through some stuff. They've been through the fire, in other words. They come out the other side refined. They didn't walk. This is what James is saying. And then let me read verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, it sounds a bit like James is changing the subject, right? Okay, trials, now let's talk about wisdom. But he's not. He's saying, if you can't, on your own, put your suffering in its proper place, account for it in the right place, what should you do? Throw your hands up and walk? No. Ask God for wisdom. After the service just last night, I talked to a young woman who says, I don't even want to trust God, but I want to want to. I thought, that is so honest and true. I I right now don't trust him, but I want to want to. So I said, well, pray for that then. She's in the middle of a trial. Pray for that. He's saying, when you you, you come to a place in your own pain or suffering that you just can't make sense of it, you can't reconcile it, you're having a hard time counting it joy, he says, ask God for wisdom. Ask God. Seek him. He is generous, and he longs to give you that perspective. It is the wisdom from God for the perspective you need to face the trial that you're in. Now, let me just give a little more point of clarity as a kind of an aside here. I think it's important to point out that what James is not saying, what some of you might be thinking. James is not saying that God is causing all this horrific stuff in your life to grow your faith. Because that wouldn't make sense, would it? Count it joy. Like we're, we see almost daily uh, some new, new breaking story in the Me Too movement where people in positions of power are abusing women or children. Are we count the, do we count that joy? Is that what James is saying? Count it all joy? No, absolutely not. No. As Christians, we hate injustice. We care for the oppressed and the vulnerable. And Jesus did the same. What James is saying is you can recognize this is painful, this is awful, this is evil, this should not be. And at the same time, I trust that my God can somehow do something in my heart through it. In our culture, it's one or the other. It's either all good or it's all bad. But the Bible, James is saying, you need to come to the place where you can say, this is wrong and unjust and painful. And yet, I believe that God can do something in it. Look at the cross for a minute. Over there. Actually, look at it. Turn your heads, look. The cross is the symbol of that very truth. It's wicked. The Son of God had to die. It's wrong. It's unjust. He was innocent. It's horrific, an instrument of torture. And yet, inside of God's will, it happened, and he brought the redemption of the world out of it. I'm not, I don't want to minimize pain or, or, or you to think that, well, this doesn't make sense. How do we count this, the evils of the world joy? He's talking about in your own life, when you face trial, you can't hold two things in tension. One, this hurts and it's wrong, and at the same time, my God is greater, and he can do something in me through it. Okay, what about this part about not doubting, right? James says, don't doubt. If you ask God for wisdom, but you doubt, he, like, it's, it's, it, it, here's what it sounds like. Pray to God for wisdom, but if you have one doubt, God goes, la, 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 la. I'm not listening to your prayers anymore, right? That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. Because he, we hear doubt and we think, we think doubt, we think psychological uncertainty. That's not what he means by doubt. The word for doubt in Greek means double-minded or dual allegiance. What James is saying is when you pray for God, to God for wisdom, you're, the very fact you're praying for wisdom is because you have questions, right? That's the whole point. When you can't reconcile this, when you do have questions, when there is psychological uncertainty, when you are wondering, God, where are you? Read the Psalms. They're full of people crying out, God, what are you doing? Where are you? Thomas is called what, Thomas? Doubting Thomas. And Jesus doesn't zap him and kill him for his doubts. He says, touch me and see. So having questions is not wrong or sinful. It's not what James means. He means, can you, at the deepest level of your soul, amidst all these questions, 
Can you still hold on to the goodness of God? Can you still have allegiance to God? Can you say, I don't get it, I don't understand it, I don't know what you're doing or why you're not doing what I think you should do, but I'm going to trust you. Like Job says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's what he means by not doubting. At the deepest level, holding on to the reality of God amidst your questions and uncertainties. I, I don't know where I am in my notes. Okay, when James says, remain steadfast, I'm going to skip over verses 12 through 15 for the interest of time. We'll come back to that. Basically, James is teaching us that this. When you face trials and you experience pain and you wonder where God is and what he's doing, you have a choice. Skip to the next slide. You can either view your present trials through the lens of your good God, or you can view God through the lens of your present trials. This is, it comes down to this. When you face pain and difficulty, you can either say, I'm going to hold on to faith in God in the midst of my questions and, and, and uncertainties, or I'm going to define God by my present pain. I bought these binoculars at Walmart last night for this sermon. Um, you know, you look through binoculars, and they're supposed to make things far away appear closer, right? That's kind of like faith. When our faith is operating accurately, as James is saying, it makes God feel closer. He's closer to you, Paul says, than you are to yourself. He's near to the brokenhearted. He's with you, even though you don't feel like it. And so when we're looking accurately, counting it joy, putting it in its proper place, asking God for wisdom, he, he's coming closer to us. But for most of us, when we face pain, we do this. Right? And what happens when you flip them around? You go cross-eyed, but also... It seems farther away. God appears further away than he actually is. This is a metaphor I think that's helpful to me. I hope it is to you. When you're in pain, when you're facing trial or difficulty of any kind, the temptation is to see God as far away, as distant, like he doesn't care, like he isn't involved. And it's not true. It's not true. James is saying, stop, consider, count, reckon, your trial in the proper place. If you struggle with that, ask God for wisdom. He's closer to you than you realize. This is, and this is why in verses 16 through 18, let me read those for you now. This is, this is who we face it with. What most of us need is not theology lessons when we're in pain. It's to know we're not alone. Would you agree? Let me read verses 16 through 18. Do not be deceived, my brothers, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James is a harsh guy. He's got a hard edge to him. You're going to find out as we go through this, he's kind of in your face. But this is a beautiful little moment of compassion and tenderness to his brothers and sisters who are far away and in fear, in pain, facing trials. He says, don't be deceived. What is this? It's deception. It's not, you're not as far away, Tom, as you look right now, right? It's deception. Don't be deceived, he says, my beloved brothers and sisters. I was thinking about this, and I want you to hear it as if it's from God. My beloved brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. God has not abandoned you. Brothers and sisters, if you're in trial, don't be deceived. You're not alone. Beloved brothers and sisters, if you're up against it, don't be deceived. God has not abandoned you. He's not done with you yet. Beloved, don't be deceived. God is still at work. Beloved, don't be deceived. God is still good. Beloved, don't be deceived. He still has a purpose and a plan, and you still belong to him. He's redeemed you by the word of truth, James says. He's still at work. He's still good. He hasn't abandoned you. You're still his. Don't be deceived. Because you can either run toward God or away from God when you're in trial. When you experience pain or loss or disappointment or difficulty, whether it's from the outside or whether you cause it yourself or whatever the case, we can do one of two things. You can run away from God or you can run to God. And I see both happen all the time. Years ago, I was in Target buying something, and because I'm a little bit taller, I saw across like this, the aisle this guy who I hadn't seen in church for years, and I know why. 
faced some trials and kind of ran away. And he looked up and he saw my eyes, and I saw his eyes, and I saw that he saw my eyes, and I saw that he saw that my eyes, like this, you know, mm-hmm. and, he went, and then he went like this. <laughs> you know? So I usually would just walk away, I would embarrass the guy, but I thought, ah, I'm going to walk over. And I walked over, and I said, hey, I miss you. No shame, but I've been praying for you. You're welcome back anytime. Two months later, we had coffee, and he said that was the thing that God used to sort of turn him around. Because the truth is, we run away from that which we most need when we most need it. Isn't that true in your life? How do you run away from God? You run away from his word. You stop spending time listening to what he says to you in his word. You run away from prayer. You stop crying out to him and trying to listen to his voice in your own heart. And you run away from his people. You stop showing up to worship and being surrounded by the community of faith, which can encourage you. The things you most need when you're in trial, we tend to run from. And James is saying, don't be deceived. Don't run. Don't run. Run to him. Let me tell you a place where I saw this most powerfully in my life. Last summer, my wife and I had the chance to travel to Zambia, Africa, and visit a cure hospital. Cure is a ministry that's putting first world hospitals in developing countries to help children that are facing real serious issues. And on this ward, these parents who travel hundreds of miles with them on foot to get to cure just wait for their children, child to have a chance to be operated on. And the parents don't have any money. There's no hotels. They sleep on the floor, the hard linoleum floor, tile floor of this hospital ward next to their child's bed, waiting for them to have a, what in their mind is a miraculous procedure. In a lot of ways, it's a hard place to be. Children suffering is hard. But in a deeper way, it was a beautiful place to be. Because every morning and every evening, these women and some men would get together, moms, dads, uncles, aunts, of these children who are suffering, and they would sing worship songs to start the day and to end the day on the hospital ward. Rather than me tell you about it, I want to show you a little clip from our time there. refrain. I, I, they're speaking Nyanja, which I can say, I love you, my wife, Nikukonda Makaziwanga, and I can say, I am hungry, Nafanjala. That's all I can say in Nyanja. <laughs> but they're singing in Nyanja, and the refrain you heard over and over again, that refrain is, my God is with me. My God is always with me. How perfect is that? He's always with me. Even in the hospital ward. See a little boy coming down the aisle, rolling in his wheelchair? His name is Gift. <laughs> That's what his name means in Nyanja. He had two club feet and dislocated hips, which is no big deal in our culture. It's an easy surgery. But there, he's a blight on his village, cursed by God, until his mom brought him. And miraculously, he's going to walk, right? Consider it all joys, brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. For you know, you know the testing of your faith produces something in you. God is not done with you. Don't be deceived. Don't run away. Run to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you um, for this ancient letter, which is so relevant for us. And the truth is, we live in a culture that doesn't really know much about suffering or pain. We think we do, but we have comfortable lives. But for all my brothers and sisters here this morning who are in their own trial of whatever kind, God, strengthen them by this word of truth. Remind them that you have not abandoned them. Give them wisdom. Help them to cry out for it and bring people alongside them to comfort them and strengthen them that you might deepen their faith through their pain. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.